The screens all lost their pictures and flipped to static. Hey! Marla cried. She banged against the side of a monitor and the image lurched, distorted, then sputtered and went out again. She hit it again and with another spasm of static, the image slowly cleared. As it resolved, the stage appeared. Something's wrong, Lamar said, and all three leaned forward, trying to get a better look. Bonnie, Jason said in a grave tone. Bonnie, Marla, Marla echoed, looking at Lamar with alarm. Where's Bonnie? Lamar hit the button on the walkie-talkie. Charlie, he said urgently. Charlie, don't leave the control room. In the control room under the stage, Charlie and Jessica peered at the monitors, scanning for signs of life. It's too dark. I can't see anything on these, Jessica complained. There, Charlie said, pointing. Jessica blinked. I can't see anything, she insisted. It's Carlton, right there. I'm going to get him. Not waiting for a response, Charlie crawled toward the exit. Charlie, wait, John said, but she was already out the door. It slammed shut behind her, and all three of them heard the dull metal thud of the drop lock falling into place. Charlie, John yelled again, but she was already gone. It's bolted shut, John grunted as he pulled on the door. The walkie-talkie sputtered, and Lamar's voice came choppily from the little box. Charlie, don't leave room. Jessica and John exchanged a glance, and John picked up the radio. Too late, he said, looking to Jessica as he lowered the walkie-talkie. Charlie made her way unsteadily between chairs, but after only moments, she realized she'd gotten herself turned around. The lighting had changed. Now a single blinding blue light was strobing on and off above the stage. Over and over, the room flashed with a blinding burst like lightning, then it was instantly dark again. Charlie covered her eyes, trying to remember what she had bumped into first. Metal chairs and foil party hats pulsed like beacons in the dark with each burst of light, and Charlie's head began to throb. She squinted, trying to orient herself, but beyond the table surrounding her, all she could see were a thousand after-images burned into her retinas. She had no idea which way to go to find Carlton. She leaned against a nearby chair and pressed her hand tightly over her forehead. The table screeched against the floor briefly, and Charlie knew that it hadn't been her. She turned around, but the light had gone dark. When it flashed again, she was looking directly at the stage, where there should have been three sets of eyes. She only saw two. Freddy and Chica stared down at her, their plastic gazes catching the light, twinkling the strobe. Their heads seemed to follow her as she moved along the table. Bonnie was gone. Suddenly she felt exposed, all at once noticing just how many places there were in the open room for something to hide, just how visible she was to anyone, anything, that might be watching. She thought briefly of the little control room she'd just left and felt a pang of regret. Coming out here might have been very stupid. Another screech sounded, and she whirled around to see the table behind her moving slowly away. She turned to run, but she slammed into something before she could take a step. She jerked up her hands in the darkness to shield herself and touched matted fur. The strobe threw its light out again, and this time garbled noise blared from the gaping mouth in front of her. Bonnie. Bonnie stood only inches from her, his mouth opening and closing rapidly as, and his eyes rolling wildly in his head. Charlie jerked away, then backed up slowly. The rabbit did not try to follow, just continued his bizarre and silent incantation, his eyes aimlessly ricocheting in his head. Her foot caught on the leg of a metal folding chair. She fell back, landing hard on her bottom. She started to crawl, staying low, hurrying to get away from Bonnie. A spotlight flashed from the stage. This one clearly aimed at her. She raised her hand to see who was there, but the light blinded her. All she could make out were two sets of following eyes. Charlie screamed and scrambled to her feet. She took off running, not looking back, and made it across the room to the hallway that led to Pirate's Cove. She ducked into the bathroom along its wall. The door echoed when it shut behind her. The room was empty with nothing but three sinks and three stalls. Only one of the fluorescent lights was on, and just barely. Only enough to color the room dark gray instead of black. The metal walls of the stall dividers looked flimsy, and Charlie had a sudden vision of Bonnie, larger than life, grabbing the metal frame with his paws and ripping it up from the ground, the bolts tearing right out of the floor. She banished the thought and ran into the farthest stall from the door, slipping the lock so small it looked almost delicate, into place. She sat on top of the toilet tank, her feet pulled up onto the seat and her back pressed against the blue tile wall of the bathroom. In the empty room, Charlie could hear her own breath echoing. She forced it to slow and closed her eyes, telling herself to be silent, to hide. Charlie! John was still pounding on the little door of the control room. Charlie, what's going on out there? 
Jessica sat quietly, still rattled from the screams and crashes outside. She can take care of herself, John said, easing his grip on the door. Yeah, Jessica said. He didn't turn around to look at her. We have to get out of here, John said. He rattled the door again. The top swayed a little as he pulled, but the bottom was stuck fast. He hunched down farther. There was a lock, a deadbolt, that dropped straight into the floor. The latch to pull it open had broken off long ago, leaving only a jagged ledge so thin he could scarcely get his fingers around it. As he yanked it upwards, it cut into his fingers, leaving thin red lines. The bolt stayed fast in place. Jessica, you try, he said, turning to her. Her eyes were on the wall of televisions. They were all showing static, but every now and then one flashed a picture. Never mind, John said. Keep watching. He bent his head again and went back to the deadbolt. In the bathroom, Charlie was silent. She paid attention to each breath she took, each inhale and exhale a slow, deliberate process. She had tried meditating once. She'd hated it, but now the intense focus on her breathing was calming. I guess I just needed the right motivation, she thought, like staying alive. The stalls rattled briefly, and there was a distant booming sound that went on for several seconds. It's storming outside. She kept her eyes trained on the floor. The light overhead was so dim it scarcely illuminated her stall. She held her breath. The light flickered and, left out a br and let out a brief hum, then was silent. The toilet tank she was on felt unstable. She scooted to the edge of it to quietly let her foot down. Just as the tip of her shoe touched the tile, the wide bathroom doors opened with a thunderous bang. Without thinking, she jerked her foot up, and the lid of the porcelain tank clanged like pots clattering together. She held herself perfectly still, her shoe suspended in the air, then carefully pulled her foot back into place on top of the toilet seat. That was too loud, she thought. Carefully, she leaned forward and reached up with one hand to grasp the stall divider. She pulled herself up to stand slowly, the toilet seat rocking on its hinges beneath her feet. She peered out over the top of the two stalls next to her. It was too dark to see beyond the metal stalls, and the whole row of them swayed gently from her weight. There was a shuffling sound. Something wide and heavy was sliding across the floor, not trying nearly as hard as she was to be quiet. Her eyes darted from the stall door beside her to the bathroom door. The shuffling continued, but she couldn't tell where it was coming from. The sound filled the room. Suddenly, the nebulous sound resolved. It was crisp, and it was nearby. The wall she clung to trembled slightly. She panned her gaze around the room, hoping her eyes would adjust a little more. She could make out a trash can by the door and the outline of the sinks. Apprehensively, she looked back to the door of her stall, letting her focus creep along the edges until she set her eyes on the inch-wide gap along the door. A large plastic eye stared back, unblinking and dry, fixed directly on her. Two large and unnatural rabbit ears hung over the top of the door. Charlie clasped her hand over her mouth and jumped to the floor as fast as she could, dropping to her stomach and scooting along the floor into the second stall. She heard Bonnie rattle the door of the stall she'd just left, but the shuffling feet didn't move. She crawled under the next divider and into the stall nearest to the entrance. This time her foot bumped the toilet behind her and the lid dropped down with a loud clank. Charlie froze. The shuffling thing didn't move. For what felt like an age, Charlie held her breath. He heard. He must have heard. But Bonnie still made no sound. Charlie held still and listened, waiting for another sound of movement to mask her own. Her breathing seemed louder than before. She lowered her head, trying to make out shapes along the floor. The shuffling sound resumed, and now, without warning, it was directly in front of her. She held her breath, desperately trying to make out any forms in the darkness. There he is. A large padded foot was just outside the door, as if it had stopped mid-step. Is he leaving? Please leave, Car or Charlie pleaded. There was a new sound. Stiff fabric softly crunching. What is that? The foot outside the door hadn't moved. The noise grew louder. The sound of fabric and fur twisting and stretching, tearing and popping. What is that? Charlie dug into the floor with her nails, holding down a guttural scream. He's bending over. A large paw touched down gently in front of her, then another shape. The creature's head. It was massive, filling the space under the door. Gracefully, Bonnie lowered himself to the floor and turned his head sideways until his eye met Charlie's. His giant mouth was wide open with a ghoulish excitement, as though he'd found someone in a game of hide-and-seek. A warm burst of air rolled in under the stall door. Breath? 
Charlie clasped her hand over her nose and mouth. The stench was unbearable. Another wave of it hit her face, hotter and more putrid. She closed her eyes, on the point of relinquishing the hope of escape. Maybe if she kept her eyes closed long enough, she'd wake up. Another gust of hot air hit, and she jerked back, hitting the back of her head on the toilet. She recoiled with pain and threw her arm in front of her, shielding her face against attack. But no attack came. She opened one eye. Where is he? Suddenly, the metal walls around her swayed with a resounding bang. Charlie startled and covered her head as Bonnie struck again. The stalls rocked on their legs, and the bolts screeched as they were yanked free from the floor, the whole assembly seeming ready to collapse. Charlie scrambled under the last divider and climbed to her feet, grasping for the door handle to pull it shut as she ran out. She ran back into the main dining area, darting toward the control room. Her eyes no longer adjusted to the light. She ran with her hands in front of her, unable to see farther than the next few steps. John, she cried, grabbing the doorknob and yanking at it, pushing. Nothing happened. Charlie, it's stuck! John shouted back from inside as Charlie struggled with the door, and she glanced up on stage. Chica was gone. John! Charlie shouted in desperation. Without waiting for a response, Charlie took off again, running for a hall to her left, trying to get as much distance from the bathroom as possible. The hall was almost completely dark, and as she ran, open doorways yawned at her with wide black mouths. Charlie didn't stop to look inside any of them, instead only praying that nothing jumped out at her. She reached the last door and paused for a brief moment, hoping against hope that it would be unlocked. She grabbed the knob and twisted. Thankfully, it fell open easily. She slid through the door, then closed it rapidly, trying not to make a sound. She stood watching the door for a long moment, half expecting it to be flung open, and then finally she turned. It was only then that she saw him. Carlton was there. His eyes widened in surprise when he saw her, but he didn't move. And after her eyes adjusted to the dim light, she understood. He was trapped, wedged somehow in the top half of one of the animatronic suits his head poking out from the wide shoulders of the costume. His face was white and exhausted, and Charlie knew why. The spring locks. She heard her father's voice for a moment. It could snap off your nose. Carlton? Charlie said cautiously, as if her voice alone might set off the mechanisms. Yup, he said with the same faltering tone. The costume uh, is going to kill you if you... This costume is going to kill you if you move. Thanks, he wheezed, half attempting a laugh. Charlie forced a smile. Well, today's your lucky day. I'm probably the only person who knows how to get you out of that thing alive. Carlton exhaled a long and shaky breath. Lucky me, he said. Charlie knelt at his side, studying the costume for long moments without touching it. These two spring locks at the neck aren't holding anything back, she said at last. He just rigged them to snap and pierce your throat if you try to move. I have to undo those first, and then we can open the back of the costume and get you out. But you can't move, Carlton. Seriously. Yeah, serial killer man explained the not moving to me, he said. Charlie nodded and went back to looking at the costume, trying to devise an approach. Do you know who I'm wearing? Carlton asked, almost casually. What? The costume. Do you know what character it was supposed to be? Charlie studied it, then looked around until she saw the matching head. No, she said. Not everything he built made it to the stage. Her finger suddenly stopped working. Carlton, Charlie carefully surveyed the array of costumes and parts that lined the walls in varying stages of completion. Carlton, she repeated. Is he in here? With a new sense of dread, Carlton struggled to get a look behind him without moving. I don't know, he whispered. I don't think so, but I've been kind of in and out. Okay, stop talking. I'll try to work fast, Charlie said. She had the mechanism figured out, or at least she thought she did. Not too fast, Carlton reminded her. Carefully, slowly, she reached into the costume's neck and took hold of the, f the first spring lock, maneuvering it until her fingers were wedged between the lock and Carlton's neck. Careful with that artery. I've had it since I was a kid, Carlton said. Shh, Charlie whispered. When Carlton spoke, she could feel his neck move. He was not going to set off the locks by talking, she thought, but the feeling of his tendons moving under her hand was unsettling. Okay, he whispered. Sorry, I talk when I'm nervous. He clamped down his jaw and bit his lips together. Charlie reached down farther into the costume's neck and found the trigger. With a stinging snap, the lock sprang against her hand, so hard that it numbed her fingers. One down, she thought as she pulled it, harmless out of the neck of the costume. She flexed her fingers until the feeling came back into them, then crawled over to the Carlton's other side and began the process again. 
She looked over her soldier sh shoulder, excuse me, from time to time, uh, to make sure every costume was still in its place against the wall. His skin was warm under her touch, and even though he wasn't speaking, she could still feel movement, feel the life in him. She could feel his pulse against the, uh, the, excuse me, against the back of her wrist as she worked, and she blinked back unexpected tears. She swallowed hard and focused on the task, trying to ignore the fact that she was touching someone who would die if she failed him. She worked open the spring lock again, taking the impact on the palm of her hand and pulling the disabled device from the costume. Carla took a deep breath, and she st and she startled. Carlton, don't relax. He stiffened and exhaled slowly, his eyes wide and frightened. Right, he said, it's still a death trap. Stop talking, Charlie pleaded again. She knew exactly how much danger he was still in, and she couldn't bear to hear him speak now, if he was about to die. Okay, she said, almost there. She crawled around behind him where a series of ten leather and metal fasteners held the back of the costume together. She considered it for a moment. She needed to keep the costume still exactly as it was until the last moment. She sat down behind him and bent her knees, positioning herself so that she could hold the costume in place with her legs as she opened it. I didn't know you cared, Carlton muttered, as though attempting to put a joke together, but too tired and too scared to finish it. Charlie didn't answer. One by one, she worked the fasteners free. The leather was stiff, the metal tightly fitted, and each one fought back as she worked, clinging together. When she was halfway up at the back of the costume, she felt his weight begin to shift. She gripped it tighter with her knees, holding it together. Finally, she ended the last one at the nape of the neck. She took a deep breath. This was it. Okay, Carlton, she said. We're almost done. I'm going to open this and throw it forward. When I do, you pull out of it as fast as you can, okay? One, two, three. She yanked the costume open and thrust it away with all her strength, and Carlton jerked back from it, toppling roughly into her. Charlie felt a sharp, quick pain on the back of her hand as she pulled free, but the costume skittered itself halfway across the room, leaving them clear. A series of snaps sounded, making a noise like fireworks, and they both cried out, leaping back and banging into a heavy metal shelf. Together they watched the empty costume writhe and twist across the floor, and anim the animatronic parts snapping violently into place. When it came to a stop, Charlie stared, fixated. The thing was just a torso, just an object. Beside her, Carlton let out a low, pained groan, then turned and vomited onto the floor beside him, heaving and retching like he would be turned inside out. Charlie watched, unsure what to do. She put a hand on his shoulder and kept it there as he finished, wiped his mouth, and sat gasping for breath. Are you okay? she said, the words sounding small and ridiculous. Carlton nodded wearily, then winced. Yeah, I'm fine, he said. Sorry about the floor. Guess it's your floor, kind of. You might have a concussion, Charlie said, alarmed. But he shook his head, moving more slowly this time. Uh, no, I don't think so, he said. My head hurts like somebody hit it really hard. I feel sick from being stuck in this room and pondering my death for hours. But I think uh, I'm okay. My mind is okay. Okay, Charlie said doubtfully, then something she had said finally registered. Carlton, you said serial killer man explained and uh, for you not to move. You saw who did this to you? Carlton got to his knees carefully, then stood bracing himself on a nearby box. He looked at Charlie. I was trapped in that thing for hours. I all tingly. He shook out his foot as if to make the point. Did you see who it was? Charlie repeated. Dave the guard, Carlton said. He sounded almost surprised that she didn't know. Charlie nodded. She had known already. What did he tell you? Not much, Carlton said. But... His eyes opened suddenly as if he just remembered something of grave importance. He looked away from Charlie and slowly dropped to his knees. What is it? Charlie whispered. Do you want to hear? He said. He seemed suddenly calm for someone who had so narrowly escaped death. What is it? She demanded. He glanced nervously at her for a moment and then took a deep breath, his face draining to white. Charlie, the kids, all those years ago. Charlie snapped to attention. What? All of them, Michael and the others, they were taken from the dining room when no one was looking, and they were right here. Carlton suddenly recoiled and moved toward the doorway, watching the walls as though they were crawling with invisible creatures. He, Dave... This is the guard. He brought them here. 
Carlton rubbed his arms like he was suddenly cold and squinted in pain. He put them into suits, Charlie, he said, his face twisting in sorrow or disgust. Charlie! He stopped abruptly, a faraway look in his eyes. They're still here. How do you know that? Charlie said in such a soft whisper that she was almost inaudible. Carlton motioned toward the far corner of the room. Sorry. Charlie looked. A yellow Freddy costume was propped against the wall. The costume all fitted together as if he were about to walk on stage for a show. That's the one. That's the bear I remember from the other restaurant. Charlie clasped her hand over her mouth. Other restaurant? Carlton looked puzzled. I don't understand. Charlie's gaze was still fixed on the yellow costume. Carlton, I don't understand! Her tone was urgent. Michael! Charlie stared at him. Michael? What do you mean? She said in a level voice. I know how it sounds, he said. And then his voice dropped to a whisper. Charlie, I think it's Michael in that suit. I still can't get this thing out, John sighed in frustration and rubbed his hand. The lock was leaving harsh red imprints on his fingers. Jessica murmured something sympathetic, but she didn't take her eyes off the screens. I can't see anything, she burst out after a moment. The radio squawked and then Marla's voice came, calling to them from the control room in Pirate's Cove. Both of you be quiet and don't move. They froze, hunching down in their places. Jessica looked at John, a question in her eyes, but he shrugged as at a loss as she was. Something thudded against the door. John jumped away, almost falling. Marla, Jessica said with a pale expression. Marla, that's you out there, right? The thud came again, more powerful than before, and the door shook under it. What is that, a sledgehammer? John whispered hoarsely. The door pounded in again and again, dense appearing as the metal do- uh, yeah, dense appearing in the metal door, which had looked so solid. They huddled back against the control panel with nothing to do but wash. Jessica grabbed the back of John's shirt, nodding the cloth between her fingers, and he didn't shake her away. The door rocked in again, and this time a hinge unfolded slightly, exposing a thin crack between the door and the frame. The door still held, but it wouldn't hold for long. John felt Jessica's fingers tighten up on his shirt. He, uh, he wanted to turn and give her some sort of comfort, but he was mesmerized, unable to look away. He could almost see out through the little open space, and he craned his neck. Another blow came, and the crack widened, and on the other side, he saw eyes peering in, calm and expressionless. Get out! Get out! Marla shouted, waving her hands at the security monitor as if John and Jessica could see her, as if it would do any good if they could. Lamar had both hands clapped over his mouth, his eyes wide, and Jason was sitting on the floor waiting nervously as though an attack on their own door might begin at any moment. The monitors were dark, but it was clear that something large was lurking in front of the main stage. A uh, a black static shape that prowled back and forth, momentarily blocking the entire picture. Marla, Lamar whispered, hoping to quiet her. Marla, look! He pointed to the monitor showing Pirate's Cove just outside the door. Marla looked over his shoulder at the other screen. The curtain was pulled back, and the space was completely empty. The other order sign hung perfectly on the platform, straight across the platform, untouched. The lock, we didn't, Marla said feebly, realizing now the magnitude of their mistake. Marla turned to Jason and let out a panicked whimper. The door behind was slowly opening. Shh! Lamar quickly flipped a small switch, killing the light in the control room, and backed against the wall next to the door. Marla and Jason mimicked his motions, flattening themselves against the wall across from them. The monitor still flickered with static, illuminating the space in unlistening grays and occasional flash of white. The small door creaked outward uh, at an excruciating pace, a gaping black void widening until the door stopped fully open. Marla, a static-laced voice, uh, called from somewhere on the floor. Lamar shot his foot out across the narrow carpet, trying to catch the walkie-talkie. Shh! Marla closed her eyes, pleading in her mind for Jessica to stop talking. Marla, where are you? Jessica's voice called again. Lamar managed to flip the walkie-talkie on its side, and with a click, it went silent. He didn't know if he jostled the battery out of place or somehow managed to flip the switch, but it didn't matter. There was nowhere to hide in the tiny room. The ceiling was too low to stand, and even with their backs against the wall, their legs stretched under the door frame. The ledge under the door was high enough to hide their legs from anything outside, but not from anything that managed to get in. At once, they stopped breathing. 
The room was no longer empty. Something was entering the space. As it pressed forward into the into the room, they saw a snout and its scratchy gloss of two unblinking eyes staring straight ahead. The monstrous head threatened to fill the room. Foxy, Jason mouthed, making no sound. The plastic eyes clicked left and right with unnatural motions, searching, but not seeing. The jaw twitched as though about to open, but never did. The dim light from the monitors gave his face a reddish hue, leaving the rest of him shrouded in darkness. His head slowly moved backward, his ears moving up and down at random, programmed as an afterthought a decade before. As Foxy backed away, his eyes thrashed back and forth, one partially hidden under a rotting eye patch. Marla held her breath, dreading the moment when the, fa when the eyes would fix on her, when the eyes clicked to the right and found Marla. The head stopped, his jaw frozen, slightly open. The plastic eyes remained on Marla, who sat in terrified silence. After a moment, the head retreated, leaving a black and empty space. Jason darted forward to grab the door outside and shut it, and Marla made a weak grab at him, trying to stop him. He brushed past her, then stopped, kneeling in the doorway. He looked into the darkness, only now afraid of what must be there. He crawled slowly forward, his torso disappearing temporarily as he reached outside for the doorknob, then pulled himself back in and gently closed the door. Marla and Lamar closed their eyes and let out a deep breath at the same time. Jason looked at them. He was almost smiling when, in a blur, the door burst open again and an ugly metal hook sank into his leg. He screamed in pain. Marla leaped to grab him, but she was too slow. She watched helplessly as Jason was dragged through the doorway. Marla, he cried, clawing futilely at the floor, and she howled in despair as he was taken from her again, nothing visible of his assailant but the awful glimmer of the hook. Marla dove toward the door after him, falling to her knees and crawling toward the thing, but Lamar grabbed her shoulder and yanked her back, taking hold of the door. Before he could pull it shut, it was ripped from his hands with an inhuman strength. Suddenly, Foxy was there before them, coming inside. He was full of life, a different creature, and he turned to look at Marla, his silver eyes appearing to comprehend. His face was a canine rictus, the scrappy orange fur insufficient to cover up his skull. He looked between them, turning his ghoulish smile first on Lamar, then Marla. His eyes flared and dimmed, and he snapped his jaws with a sound like something breaking. They stared, backed up against the control panel. And then Lamar realized suddenly what he, uh, what he was looking at. He can't fit all the way in, he whispered. Marla looked. It was true. Foxy's shoulders were jammed into the doorway, his head the only part he could wedge through the door. Lamar lunged forward and kicked the animatronic, bracing himself against the wall and striking out with his foot three times before Foxy gave a low whine, a sound more machine than animal, and sucked back onto the dark, uh, uh, out into the dark. Lamar snapped the door shut behind him and slid the deadbolt into place. They stared at each other for a long moment, breathing hard. Jason! Marla screamed. Lamar put his arms around her. She let him hug her, but she didn't cry. She closed her eyes. What do you mean it's Michael in the suit? Charlie said softly, as if she might be talking to someone who'd gone mad, while also desperate to hear the answer. Carlton looked at the yellow bear for a long moment, and when he turned back to Charlie, his face was calm. He opened his mouth to speak, and Charlie put a finger to his lips. Something was coming. She could hear footsteps out in the hall, moving toward them. Deliberate, heavy footsteps, the approach of someone who didn't mind if anyone heard. Charlie looked wildly around the room and spotted a pipe in a corner. She grabbed it and hurried to stand behind the door, where whoever opened it would not see her. Carlton picked up the torso as though to use it as a weapon somehow. He looked confused, like he wasn't thinking. Don't, Charlie warned in a low voice, but she was too late. Something snapped inside the suit. Carlton dropped it and stepped back, a shimmer of blood on his hand. Are you okay? Charlie whispered. He nodded, and then the doorknob turned. Dave appeared in the doorway, his head held high, and his face grim. It should have been imposing, but he just looked like an old man walking th through a door. His face darkened. Before he could move, Charlie raised the pipe high, stepped forward, and swung it down on his head with a sickening thunk. Dave turned, shock on his face. Charlie lifted the pipe ready to attack again, but the man stumbled backward against the wall and dropped into a sitting position. Carlton, come on, Charlie said urgently, but he was looking down at his injured hand. Carlton, are you hurt? No, he said. 
shaking off his reverie and wiping his hand down with his black shirt. Come on, Charlie said firmly, taking his arm. Come on, we have to get the others out of here. I don't know how long he'll stay out. You're awfully calm for having just knocked a guy out cold, she thought wryly. They crept out into the hallway, lit only by the dim glow of light from the other rooms. Charlie hustled through the wings, uh, the swinging doors to the kitchen, where the dark was total. The air was thick with a blackness that was almost tangible, as if they'd been swallowed. She turned to look at Carlton, but only the faint sound of his breathing told her that he was still beside her. Something touched her arm, and she stifled a scream. It's just me, Carlton hissed, and she let out a sigh. Let's make sure we aren't being followed. Then we can find the others and get out of here, she whispered. Charlie glanced back at the door, and the last spots of light peeking under it. She scooted herself a little closer to it, and got to her feet to peer through the, win the round window, careful not to touch it. What do you see? Carlton whispered. Nothing. I think it's safe. Just as she finished speaking, a form passed by, darkening the window. Charlie jumped back, almost falling over Carlton. They stumbled forward, rushing to get away from the door. Suddenly, two beams split in the darkness, illuminating the room in a harsh yellow light. Chica loomed there, almost on top of them. She stretched up to her full height, growing taller still. She must have been hiding here all along, Charlie thought. The dark recesses of the kitchen could be hiding anything. Chica looked at both of them in turn, the beams of light shifting dizzily as her eyes snapped mechanically from one open side to the other. Then she paused, and Charlie grabbed Carlton's arm. Run, she screamed. They took off, looping around the prep table, the metal furniture clattering as they rushed clumsily past it. Behind them, Chica's steps were long and slow. At last, they reached the door, and they burst out into the hall and ran for the main dining room. John and Jessica were silent, listening to the clamor outside. John was resting his hand on the door of the control room. Whatever had been on the other side was gone, or at least was pretending to be. The lock had been wrenched out of the floor. John tried the knob, but the door, it twisted out of shape, still stuck. Are you crazy? Jessica ex exclaimed, alarmed. What else are we going to do? John said calmly. Jessica didn't answer. John backed up against the control panel and gave the door a calculated kick, moving an inch closer to opening. Here, let me, Jessica said, and before he could reply, she delivered a kick of her own, the door again moving just a little. They took turns, not speaking, and finally, John, and finally, John kicked and the top hinge broke. John quickly wrestled the door out of the way, all, uh, all the way off until they could crawl out. They hurried out and stopped, exposed in the main dining room. Jessica looked at the main stage in misery. It was empty. I don't know how much, uh, how this is safer, she said, but John wasn't listening. Charlie, he cried, then covered his mouth with his, his hand too late. Charlie and Carlton were running from the dark hallway at a furious pace. Come on, Charlie yelled at them, not slowing down as she passed, and John and Jessica ran after them as Charlie led them out of the dining room into the opposite hall, toward the storeroom they had come in through. Charlie ran down the hall with a purpose, stopping in front of a closed door and trying to get it open. Behind them loomed the open mouth of a pitch-black party room, a wide, empty space that could have hidden anything. Is it locked? Carlton asked, an edge of rising panic in his voice. No, just stuck, Charlie said. She forced it, and the door popped open. They hurried inside, John lingering until the last moment, his eyes still on the darkness behind them. Don't turn the light on, he said. We have enough light, let your eyes adjust. There was a window high up on the door, thick glass with bubbling, frosted pattern that let a trickle of light and color into the room from the hallway. Right, Charlie said. A light on in here would have marked them out clearly. In the semi-darkness, she surveyed the room. It had been an office. Not one that she remembered uh, visiting every often. She was not sure who had used it. There were cartons here and there on the floor, overstuffed to bulging with papers. Their lids perched sheepishly on top of the mess inside. There was an old uh, desk in the corner, a grayish-blue metal with visible dents in the surface. Lock the door, Jessica said in an irritated tone. And Charlie did. There was a button set into the knob, which they knew would be useless, and a flimsy bolt lock, the kind in bathroom stalls and on picket fences. I guess it's better than nothing, she said. Got me running in a circle.